I am Mary Haver. I'm a project manager working in our GI category and I'm going to go through a little of the company history and then Michelle will actually take over providing you with results, which I'm sure that's what everybody is more interested in hearing anyways. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay, P&G has been around since I think the late 1800s. We have about 138,000 employees in um, over 80 countries in the world. We, um, P&G as a company actually makes about, or has the profit was about 76.5 billion in 2007. Of that, about 41% comes out of the health and beauty areas. So about $32 billion are from that area. Pharmaceuticals is a very small portion of the actual Procter & Gamble company. We only contributed about $2 billion to the profit for the last year, but we also only have about 600 employees working on the drug development process. 600 employees in R&D, let me clarify. Um, we do have a lot, you know, a larger organization working sales and, and so on. We have, of those 600 employees, only about two-thirds of them are actually captured within our CCPM structure and our TP Global. So we aren't, you know, utilizing the system for the whole life cycle of a uh, project, per se, okay? So I just want to give you an example. I know yesterday uh, the other pharmaceutical uh, presenter talked about the pharmaceutical project or how long their timeline was. For us, we are new, chem new chemical entities, so our timeline is a lot longer than generics, which is what he was referring to. A drug development process takes 10 to 15 years, so it's a really long process, starting in preclinical, going to phase one, which is when you start actually introducing the drug into humans, phase two, when you're actually looking at the indicated you know, what you think you're, you are going to be preventing or helping, and then phase three when you go into a larger clinical studies. We have a lot of decision points along this process, as you can see by the diamonds on the chart that we have there. And high failure rate. We only have about one in 10 drugs that are actually successful. So this tells you why pharmaceutical drugs are so expensive when you go and get them at the pharmacy. It's because it's $500 million just to bring one drug to market. It's pretty substantial spending for the pharmaceutical companies. So our customers, you know, regulatory agencies are the biggest ones. We have to submit all the data to the regulatory agencies in whichever country we're applying. Um, doctors, consumers, obviously, they're not going to buy your product, product if it isn't actually working and doing what it's supposed to be doing. And managed health care as well. So uh, what is a project of P&GP? We Basically, every bar that you see on this chart here represents a project. Some of them are broken down a little bit further than they are here, but, you know, it starts off with preclinical. That would be a separate project within our portfolio. Then we have the non-clinical, which is the longest chain there. That can be five to ten years long, the non-clinical piece. Then we have uh, early, early development quality CMC work, so actually making the drug product. The quality CMC, once you've actually, you're trying to actually get the product ready for market. And then in parallel, we have a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of these things are going along in parallel, but we have clinical studies. So clinical study can be, in the early phases, they're pretty short, but on the, the tail end, they could be one to three years long. Um, quality supply chains can be one to four years long. So each of these are long duration activities or projects within our portfolio. And then from there, obviously, they lead to, into a submission plan. Submission plan can be six months to 12 months, depending on how complicated your submission is going to be. And then we have an adjudication plan, which is actually after you file and you're waiting for the FDA to come back and grant you the license if you've proven, you know, without a doubt that the product is going to work. Uh, that, that's a question and answer period, so those are very variable how long those actually are going to take as well. And in the meantime, again, you're still working on your quality supply chain, making sure you have drug ready to launch when if or when you get approval. So in 2004, we were faced with a business challenge. Um, we were having, uh, expecting a major influx of work. We were supposed to get a lot of work and we were like, oh, we're not gonna get any more people, so what are we gonna do? So we decided to implement critical chain to help us manage the work with the resources that we did have. So our implementation, implementation goals, they were, they're a lot different than I think some that have been um, shared throughout this conference, but basically ours were more operational. 
long, because of the long duration of our work, it was hard to say, you know, we were saving so much money or contributing to the financial goals of the company in our implementation. So our operational or our implementation goals were to be able to manage project priorities and resources using a portfolio level system. We were doing a lot of one-off. We weren't standardized with the way that we were planning our projects. So we, used, we decided critical chain was going to help us standardize the process. And actually on the previous slide, I should have told you, we have templates for all those different projects that we have in there to make our processes more standardized across our whole division. And we wanted to improve productivity. We wanted to be able to take on this additional work that we were supposed to be seeing at that time. And we wanted to be capable and be able to be prepared and ready to do that. I'm going to share with you the results over our nearly four-year track. The, um, one of the things we've been looking at is our throughput. And since the beginning of our implementation, we, we first put our first projects into Concerto in the spring of 2004. And it was just about six projects um, at the time. We, we had more in the portfolio, but as you know, it takes some time to, to get the plans ready. And in the first quarter of 05 is when we started having some project completions. As Mary mentioned, kind of the long uh, time frame of most of our project plans. And so in quarter one of 05, we had about three project completions. And over time, we added more projects to the Concerto system. And we also saw an increase in throughput uh, on average. Um, since about quarter one of 06, so about the past two and a half years, we've had a pretty constant number of projects in the system, uh, ranging from about 45 to 50. So since quarter one of 06, we've gone from an average of about seven projects completed per quarter to currently about 12 projects per quarter. And already in quarter three of 08, uh, we're on an up spike again. We've already completed 14 projects this quarter, and, and it's likely that we'll complete a couple more this month. And the most important is the throughput because, of course, the more projects you complete, the more uh, impact on the business results that is, whether that's through cost savings or whether it's through um, actual sales. And we've also been tracking due date compliance because uh, as you know, getting the projects done on time it gets you either to market sooner or in our case where we do have a, a high failure rate, as Mary mentioned, um, if you can get to that go, no go decision so that you are not continuing to pour money down an empty hole, you will save the company money by, by getting those to those decisions on time. And so over the course of our implementation, we've gone from about 55% compliance and up to about 90% compliance over the last several quarters. And we've had our ups and downs, as you can see. There's, there's spikes, um, and we're working on improving that. Our initial implementation challenges were getting management commitment, as everyone talks about. And we had um, verbal buy-in to implementation, and everyone agreed that it was a good idea and it made sense, and they said, okay, project management group, go ahead and go off and go do it. And, and we had a, a bit of um, problems getting them to set the project priorities and um, taking active participation in the buffer management, as well as actually identifying and establishing uh, measures and metrics and what our goals should be. Uh, as, as Mary showed you earlier, it was just kind of a general um, increased productivity, but, but we didn't have a hard target of, say, you know, 30% or 50%. And uh, of course, the culture change was a big issue as well. Um, people didn't like doing the task updating, especially when they did have long duration tasks. Um, they, they thought it was a waste of their time. And uh, there was a lot of bad multitasking going on and, and following of priorities because without critical chain, everybody had their own set of priorities. And then also, uh, as we were setting up the system, in our TP Global, uh, we started off with several hundred different skill types because people were trying to protect their turf and they wanted the TP Global to reflect their organization structure, not necessarily just what skills are within a group. 
and uh, they also tended to hide resources um, because they, they were busy doing non-project work and, or either they were maintaining systems. Uh, everybody was working on multiple projects and, and occasionally people also get loaned out to non-pharma parts of the business. So they were very reluctant to kind of dedicate their resources. But some of the things uh, that we were able to do that enabled our success, especially over the last two years, is, is following the three basic rules. Um, with pipelining being first. It, it actually took us um, about two years before we did an actual pipelining. We just kept putting the existing projects into the Concerto pipeline with, with their existing due dates. And then we finally did a major pipelining with senior management there and everything. And it, it took us about a month to actually do the pipelining because every time we would show them the data, they didn't believe it and we'd have to go back and double check our, our numbers. And, and finally, we did arrive at some conclusions that some projects needed to um, have their due dates changed uh, or in effect you know, be frozen for a period of time. And, and that uh, kind of got our whip under control and uh, we were able to start executing more. The drum that we chose uh, is, is our statistics group because um, they're not easily outsourced. We want to keep that internal. When we're looking at new clinical results, we, we don't want to outsource that activity. And so they had a, um, a key role in delivering our business results. And of course, role number two uh, in planning and, and buffering, Mary mentioned the various templates that we developed for, we have about eight or so for the basic types of work. And using those has really helped the organization um, come to agreement on how we actually do our work and approximate times. And so then when we do start up a new project plan, it's much easier to get it up and running. And people are now understand um, you know, the concept of buffers and, and the critical change. So that's making things go a lot more smoothly. And then the buffer management execution focus. Um, before, it was kind of like pulling teeth to get anybody to look at the system. And so we've kind of been holding their hand a lot more along the last two years. We have individual meetings each month with the 15 or so uh, resource managers. And we also have a, a monthly portfolio status meeting with the resource managers and the, the project leaders so that they can understand what the overall portfolio is as well as address any questions uh, as far as where their projects fit in with the portfolio. And uh, we've come up with a few customized reports as well um, to, to share the information in a, in a format that people seem to be able to understand. And one of them is a quadrant report that we come up with, which is basically just the uh, portfolio status report, but we've kind of divided it into quadrants. And in the upper left quadrant is an area called the 50-50 zone where projects have completed less than 50% of their work and they've used more than 50% of their buffer. And we kind of uh, draw the analogy to that is, is uh, if you get paid on a monthly basis and you've spent your entire paycheck in the first week of the month, um, you might have problems um, putting gas in your car or, or eating by the end of the month. And so we want to focus on those projects that are consuming buffer at, at too high a rate. And then we also have encouraged uh, active task management by the task managers and getting better compliance and updating through this uh, weekly report that we publish. It's, it's kind of a dashboard of where we are. And we just wanted to show you uh, an example of, of our dashboard report. There's, there's four metrics that we measure. And as Mary mentioned, our, our implementation was more operational in nature. We, we didn't have any goals like we wanted to increase revenue by um, a half a million or a million dollars because when nine out of 10 of your projects don't get to market, it, it's kind of hard to, to quantify that. So we came up with surrogate markers, uh, if you will, of things that if we follow these things, then we will see an impact on the business. And the first of those is to update tasks regularly. If you don't update the tasks, we don't know what the status is, we don't know what the issues are, where we're falling behind. And so we were shooting for 80% uh, compliance. It wasn't of the individual tasks, but it was of the projects. 
eighty percent of the projects each week had all of their in progress tasks updated and our second metric that we started tracking was following task level priorities and we used the flow trend uh, report to develop this um, where we compared basically the number of red in progress tasks uh, or versus the red whip tasks tasks that either could be started or, or were started and so where resources were feeling constrained our message was focus on the red tasks so that we're moving those along uh, one of our resource managers came up with a, a good analogy in that um, he, if he had a really high credit card bill for the month you have to at least pay your minimum monthly amount and so in focusing on the red tasks if, if you can't pay off your entire balance you're, you're at least making your minimum payments um, and number the uh, graph at the bottom here is, is a blown up example of our uh, following task level priorities uh, chart that we use on our, our dashboard and for this again the the goal was 80 percent um, that they're following task level priorities at, at least 80 percent of the time and it's gone up and down um, and and we've been hovering around the 80 percent mark and actually the last three weeks we've, we've been right at the 80 percent mark as well and so we find that um, this is really effective in, in moving projects along those with the highest priority. And our third metric is managing the buffer. Um, we have two different things that we measure. We have a goal of having less than 10% of the projects over 100% buffer. Of course, ideally, you'd like that to be zero, but stuff happens. And also, uh, we'd like to have less than 25% of our projects um, in the red zone. And I was kind of gratified watching other people's presentations um, when they were showing portfolio charts that it, it seemed that they were struggling with the same issues and, and seeing a, a lot of projects in the red. So we're, we're still continuing to work against that one. And then our fourth metric is the flow index, or the percent of buffer consumed uh, versus the percent of work complete. And our target for that is um, less than one uh, measure of one so basically you're kind of following the yellow zone along where your work and your uh, buffer consumed is kind of even and that's kind of the, the middle spot so you haven't been too aggressive um, in your estimates that you're continually in the red but yet you haven't padded them so much that you're floating along quite easily in the green zone our current challenges, as I mentioned, is, is to continue or to improve the consistency of our, our throughput and due date compliance results. Uh, we have the ups and downs. Um, we want to get better at setting initial due dates so that we, we don't have to change the due dates. Now, occasionally there is a, a scope change where, since it is a, a research environment where plan A didn't work and you have to go back and execute plan B, so that's going to result in a, a delayed due date or occasionally a regulatory agency will come back to you and say no we think you need to do another study and, and bring us some more data um, and so that will also extend due dates but we're trying to be consistent in um, following those rules where it has to be a scope change or something like that in, in order to approve a, a due date change and we'd still like to get more proactive with our buffer management and try to reduce the number of projects that are in the red. People tend to not react until things do get in the red, and, and we'd kind of like to take advantage of that yellow zone as where that is the place where you're supposed to be developing recovery plans, not waiting until it gets in the red. And also, we'd like to reduce the variability of our indicator metrics, which have been going up and down as well. So our sustaining strategy to try and accomplish some of these ongoing challenges is, is to use the process of ongoing improvement. We have uh, implemented the delay reason, or soon to be called uh, need help um, codes in, in the upgrade that was this spring and people are, are being trained on that and starting to use that and we're starting to look into uh, understanding what the, the reasons are for uh, delays and, and where people need help the most and we also are going to try out the virtual drum pipelining 
because our statistics resource is only works on about 50% of the projects that we have in the system, um, typically the, the supply chain type plans don't have any statistical involvement. And so since the beginning, when we selected statistics, the groups that do work on the supply chain type plans have kind of complained that we're not looking at their overloads and, and helping them with their constraints. And so we're hoping that using a virtual drum with the integration points will help us kind of smooth the overall curve. And so we're working on identifying what those integration tasks are in our various templates. And then we'll run a, a simulation and, and compare our results of the virtual drum pipelining with the, the regular pipelining. And as I mentioned, continuing to work against our challenges. Um, just in the, the example with the Tata, they said education, um, getting people uh, to understand the system um, has been very helpful. And, and we've done that on a quarterly basis as well, where we, we train new users. And, um, or if it's, uh, somebody starts right away and, and it's, uh, we just had a training, we'll, we'll get to them one on one. And so those uh, have been helping us see our, our most recent results.